Hello everyone, I'm Nate Truex and you're listening to the Crockcast Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome to the Crockcast Podcast. I'm your host Nate and today I'm joined by Dr. Bruce Eilerts. Uh Bruce, welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't have a PhD, but but thanks for the compliment. <laughs> uh, so I want to get us started on uh, how you first got into reptiles and uh, your career path leading up to up to this point. Sure. Uh, well, I've uh, got a zoology degree, bachelor of science, and uh, was going for a higher degree, but uh, I wound up volunteering for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, spent a year out in the remote Hawaiian islands with seabirds, sea turtles, Hawaiian monk seals. And after a year, position opened and uh, I beat out three master's degrees and one PhD with my Bachelor of Science simply Hmm. because of the volunteer work. So I wanted to let everybody know that's a a real way in if you want to work for a Orgs, especially government agencies, they they pay for your transportation, room and board, and training. Pretty good deal if you just have the time. After that, you know, I went into, uh, as I said, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Then later, Department of Defense became the deputy director of the Goldwater Range out here in Arizona, 2.7 million acres, locked up and not all getting blown apart. Most of it is just locked up for security airspace keeping the yahoos out and uh, because of that department of defense has 25 million acres of land a lot of people don't realize that that's uh natural wild and guarded literally in some places with soldiers and weapons uh, sadly what we probably need nowadays anyway then i went on to uh center for biodiversity uh, uh worked for arizona department of transportation did a lot of wildlife connectivity relating to uh, desert tortoise, mammals, large mammals, that sort of thing, and worked for various uh, uh, consulting firms. And I just recently retired. So uh, still uh, active in terms of being interested in conservation and herps and birds and all of that. And basically, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. I have heard somewhere before that, like, uh, military bases and training facilities are inadvertently great wildlife conservation areas. So I have heard that before. Absolutely. Uh, It's kind of a best-kept secret. There's about 800 Department of Defense, I'll refer to as DOD, biologists, natural resource managers, you know, naturalists, that kind of thing. Uh, From Guam to uh, Puerto Rico and all 50 U.S. states. And... uh, It's been a great job, you know. One difference with the uh, DOD as opposed to the Department of Interior, another resource agency is, is, you know, the resource agencies have become seriously politicized, as you know, and uh, really gets in the way of the Endangered Species Act and recovery management. DOD, you know, in many cases, there's a conflict. You know, they have a mission to perform and they know they have to uh, abide by the rules under the Sykes Act, one of the many. And, you know, the wing commander, general in charge of the Air Force facility I was at, would call me in. Hey, I got this issue. Tell me what to do. <laughs> you know, that's refreshing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and a lot of times, what are the options? Here you go, sir. You know, we weigh them and, all right, let's do it. You know, Fish and Wildlife Service, good God, you know. Senator so-and-so, this golf course developers involved, you know, watch how you speak to the media and all, oh, it drove me nuts. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there's a lot of good things about yeah. the DOD. Yeah, kind of like Bambi versus Godzilla, if you will. Uh, it's pretty funny. Um so what were some of the did you mentioned you did work with uh desert tortoises you want to go into more detail yes. about that sure uh don't want to date myself but we started out with radio telemetry <laughs> which went to satellite telemetry and gps out here in the deserts and uh 
Um, I also worked as a consultant in Las Vegas most recently on those power lines, you know, from Hoover Dam down to Los Angeles. They're putting in new power corridors. And uh, sadly, Southern Nevada on the California border, there's one of the last holdouts for desert tortoise. Uh, some of the research has been done recently is showing that because of the climate change and hotter, hotter springs and summers, the time tortoise are out and about looking for a mate has drastically shortened, you know, and because of that, hmm. in most areas of the desert tortoise range right now, they're not breeding. They're not reproducing. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is people go out and see desert tortoise. They're seeing adults, you know, that are not reproducing and maybe the last in their area. And then when they go, you have uh, extirpation across the board. So Southern Nevada, for whatever reason, we still have a viable breeding population. So I'm not saying breeding doesn't occur everywhere else, but the data is showing so low, it's scaring the heck out of everybody. And uh, what the answer is, I really don't know. As you, you probably know the disease from the release of uh, Chinese tortoises and other things the public ignorantly does has introduced a deadly respiratory virus into the population. So that mm. combined with habitat loss and climate change, uh, our poor desert tortoises aren't doing too well. But uh, anyway, along with that, we have many yeah. other species we're concerned about, you know, the long-nosed leopard lizard, Gila monster, uh, uh, basically the ecology and the, the habitat in general, we're trying to protect what's left because, uh, it, as you know, the Southwest has a rich uh, uh, herb fauna. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to actually uh, find a baby desert tortoise once uh, a little less than four years ago. So, Really? Where were you at? In the Sonoran or Mojave? Uh, the St. George area of Utah. Oh, okay. The, uh, yeah, that's um, Mojave Desert. Actually, like getting Southwest in a great Utah. base in Mojave. Yeah, yeah, that's good news. <laughs> really good news. Yeah. And it was totally by accident. Uh, just walking around looking for Chuck Wallace. Little did I realize me and my friend who are not from uh, the Southwest, obviously. We were looking sure. at, at small, rocky, open plain instead of, uh, you know, up on big rock faces. We were just walking around. I was walking around. And I just looked down next to my foot, and there's this little, uh, about yay size desert tortoise. Yeah. They don't look real, do they? <laughs> Looks like one of those little plastic toys when they're holding Perfect still. Dome. And they, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just glad my foot was a few inches to, to the left or the right instead of the other way That's around. That's for sure. You know, it's really tough. Uh, you know, all the off road vehicle activity out there. That's, that's scary. Um, they're hard to see, even yeah. if you're trying to avoid them. Yeah. So uh, what are some things people can do to help with uh, desert tortoise conservation? Sure. Uh, well, when you're out there, uh, anybody interested in herps is basically, uh, if they want, collecting data. Sightings like yours of a, of a juvenile, a baby tortoise, the location. Um, free, feel free to take GPS um, coordinates of, of tortoise you find, any tortoise you find. If you see a tortoise, uh, well, don't touch it, obviously. Don't don't get in the way of I its didn't, uh, daily I'll, activities. I'll, yeah, I, no, I'm sure you didn't. Um, but uh, if you look at them, especially through binoculars, you can pretty much notice if they've got that respiratory disease. You know, unfortunately, they're face is covered with mucus you know it looks like they're drooling almost and uh, it's horrible but you know this information uh adult or baby location you know a gps coordinate would be, coordinates would be great um did it look okay you know is it missing any limbs or did it have any uh sign of respiratory disease uh even if you don't find live tortoises you know the the ravens are taking a toll on desert tortoise. You'll go to a 
a power tower out there and uh, maybe a nest and you'll just see all these empty baby tortoise shells at the bottom of the tower. It's horrible. But again, you know, location, you saw a tortoise because they will manage, you know, they'll go out and uh, deal with uh, ravens that are really taking a toll on the tortoise. So basically all of those things uh, are really important. You know, there's a lack of field biologists out there. There's not a lot of money in the budgets to fund research or even fund management. So citizen biologists are real important. Yeah. So where are some other uh, reptile species you've worked with? Uh, Gila monster, uh, uh, long-nosed leopard lizard, uh, Chuck Walla to a lesser extent here in the Southwest. I uh, worked a lot with sea turtles in the Pacific, but that's a whole different area. But, uh, you know, the, the leopard yeah, lizard is a real cool little, yeah. The leopard lizard is a really cool little predator. And uh, again, that one's on the decline. Uh, they like to come out on the dirt and gravel roads and sun the same time. Uh, all the ATV activities going on out there. And it's really rough to see when they get hit. But just uh, you asked, what can people do? You know, be aware, um, take notes, you know, and again, uh, that information, all you have to do is email it to your uh, local, each state is different, game and fish, forestry and wildlife, whatever it might be, and the feds. Now, uh, in general, you've got the bureaucrats who, okay, thanks, you know, we're, we've got all the data we need. That's the wrong answer from them. But there's people like you and I who are very interested working for these agencies who would love to just get an email. And, and actually, they probably say, hey, you want to go out sometime? You know what I mean? And uh, do a survey with me or a check. You know, I, I did work with some... Uh, Yellow Lake frogs in, in California, briefly, that sort of thing. But um, as I said before, volunteering, uh, you, you'd be surprised at how willing uh, agency personnel and agencies themselves are to take volunteers out and actually go out on your own. They'll give you the, sometimes they'll give you the uh, satellite or radio tracking equipment, you know, to go out and actually I had a friend doing Gila monster work in, in Nevada in the uh, McCullough mountain range south of Vegas. And she got out every couple of days and just uh, see where the Gila monsters are, tracking them. And it's just amazing how tortoise and Gila monsters get around. They'll cross under interstates, you know, through drainage tunnels and stuff. And they're, they're uh, busy yeah. little guys. And they will, you know, they'll plot this and, and produce maps. And we can learn a lot from that. So uh, that's a you know I, I really ask that you, you tell your your uh, followers you know to feel free to get involved. And uh, I, I sort of went over that already. I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but that really is great. Plus, it's, it's a, a lot of fun. Feeding, though. Yeah, yeah, it's you know 190 degrees, insects bursting into flames. You know, <laughs> a little rough out there in the summer. <laughs> Not that bad, yeah. but, you know, last summer was the hottest in Earth's history. And uh, I think Phoenix went 40-some days at 115 degrees plus. And that's just, that's crazy for even here. And I'm in Tucson. But, uh, yeah, you can imagine what our, our critters are going through out there, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. anyway. I've been thinking about moving to uh, Tucson for like a year or two just to do uh, herbing. So you'd love it. It's uh, I'm serious. You know, going out and driving at night after the monsoon rains, it's like like Christmas. That's the exact I mean? reason I want to go. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. And I, we do. I want to get to those Sky Island Mountains. So Let's get where? I want to get into those uh, Sky Island Mountains. Oh yeah, yeah. They're easily accessible. They have light, nice long 
roads and some of them uh, aren't well traveled on weekdays or definitely not at night and actually again what could people do bring your your snake stick or tongs or whatever because uh unfortunately we still have a demographic of idiots here who think it's fun to run over rattlesnakes and tortoise yeah. so moving them out of the way i don't want to say you should with threatened species but you know uh I know it happens, and I tend to think uh, it's probably better. Don't handle them with your hands. Like, good good thing, I yeah. just remember. Uh, we transmit diseases easily to herbs, so especially tortoise. Just, uh, you know, stand there and encourage the tortoise to leave the road if you can. Um, that sort maybe of thing. Bring, and Maybe bring a box of uh, sterile gloves. Absolutely. Yeah, that sort of thing. So, but yeah, you'd love Tucson, even on the dirt roads. And, you know, yeah. one of Arizona's best kept secrets is the Chiricahua Sky Islands. Uh, boy, still, it's a drive to get out there about three hours from Tucson, but remote, very uh, sparsely inhabited and rarely visited. And most of the time it's birders. But uh, if you spend a couple of days out there in the monsoon season, driving the roads with spade foot toads and you know all kinds of snakes and lizards and amphibians you, your brain will explode <laughs> yeah. yeah so you mentioned you did work with uh heel monsters and i've done a little bit of work in <laughs> uh in the captive setting with heel monsters uh we just talk about them a little bit like their uh biology and, like what threats they face sure uh my Gila monster work has been sort of inadvertent. Uh, you know, when I ran into them, I was a wildlife manager and uh, always interested in conservation and collecting data. They're very uh, uninterested in, in hurting anybody, as you, I'm sure, know. Uh, a lot of people think they're going to jump out and lunge for your throat, you know, that sort of thing. The general I've public. That's like a monster I'd ever seen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've stood there and had them literally walk up and bump into my boot and just change direction. You know, just not interested at all. Very susceptible to roadkill, over collecting. But again, uh, they seem to be doing all right. You know, uh, they're mostly not colonel, as you know, a lot of this, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, you don't see them out during the day very often, except uh, this time of year, March, April, especially in the rains, uh, warm, warm days with high humidity, overcast, um, you're likely to run into one out there in the Bajadas or Creosote Flats. And uh, a lot of times people have sent down the little, what do you call it, little scopes. Um, it's not coming to mind. Same thing, they ram up your keister when they're looking for... <laughs> Uh, some sort know, of camera colon. yeah yeah it's a camera go down there and you know you'll see a gila monster in there with a with a rattlesnake or well most most of the time not a rattlesnake a tortoise you know just sharing the burrows and that's a lot of fun just anyway you know what's down this burrow you know it could be mammals but a lot of times it's just that's where the herps are hanging out when it's cold or, or extremely hot so uh, we're still learning about gila monster and uh, it's a really fascinating creature. Yeah, uh, it's one new, relatively new podcast I follow. It's called the Flipping Ten Podcast. They were talking about those little things that you can get, like an attachment for your iPhone or something like that. Oh, really? They have off them Amazon, now. and they're not too expensive. No, so. go go for it. I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah. You know? And again, it's uh, low impact, and you're collecting data. You know, maybe you're in an area with a high Gila monster density and believe me there's very little known we we have range maps but we don't know where the the main concentrations are uh when we were doing this uh power line work in nevada you know watching for tortoise and endangered birds whatever uh one day we got seven gila monster just <laughs> moving around yeah in about a three mile st stretch of dirt road in, in a desert mountain range south of Vegas. I mean, you know, so if we're seeing seven of them by accident, you know, just by, again, having a number of biologists out there, which doesn't happen all the time, 
you know, I think that's a good sign. I mean, what aren't we seeing? You know, so hopefully yeah. there's a, a nice healthy population still hanging on in most areas. Uh, you did some, did you ever do any uh, radio telemetry work with Gila monsters? Not personally. A friend of mine did. Um, she was working on the uh, power line project as a contractor with, with many of us who were out there doing the same thing. And uh, after that particular day, when we got seven, uh, she stayed out and, and waited for Nevada game and fish, fish and game, I can't remember, uh, to show up and, and uh, attach the transmitters. And after that, they said, hey, do you mind coming out here once or twice a week and finding Mr. Gila Monster? And, you know, she had like five of them uh, fitted with these radio transmitters. And uh, a lot of data was collected just, again, by accident, being out there at the right time, you know, finding it, you know, even not looking for them, but because you were there. And this is what you were asking, what could people do? And calling your your game and fish or fish and wildlife person, and the next thing you know, you know you're you're making a major contribution to reptile conservation. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask: Is it true that Gila monsters will actually uh, move quite a lo lot of long distances? A lot they longer have, than, than people. They have. Think? They have. Yeah, and and what really amazed me was uh, the vertical movement was astounding. I mean, you know, you think big orange sheep or something else. I mean, how these guys, I got to tell you, you know, 90, 90 degree inclines and, you know, you're like, wait a minute, that was two days ago. You know, how did this guy <laughs> cross these creosote flats and low hills and climb that freaking cliff? You know, it's like, uh, they're amazing. So I'm, you know, I'm not sure that's, that's, uh, well, I, I think the climbing is probably common, but I don't know how far they'll actually range. I'm not sure anyone can answer what is a normal distance. What's well, a normal home range size? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But. Yeah. So switching back to uh, long-nosed leopard lizards, uh, I also was lucky enough to find a, a few of those when I was out in Utah. Beautiful um, little guys, yeah. Yeah, gorgeous little lizards. Uh, yeah, they're, they're back in, um, back in uh, summer 2020. Um, were you near Kanab or uh, do you remember where you were area. at? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great area. Um, you know, if you handle them, they're, they're really tough little guys. They got attitude. <laughs> They'll yeah. latch on. Well, you know, you know herbs will. will bite you it's really unless they're venomous uh, you might get a little prick or some abrasions but uh you know they're just doing what comes natural but little leopard lizards man they're fast they'll just take out you know their prey like like that you know and uh, lightning fast and take off with their meal you know it's amazing uh so uh speaking of their meal what is their primary diet consist of imagine uh, there's probably a lot of insects in it Insects and, and a lot of um, little lizards, you know, uh, side blotched, uh, 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 zebra tail, earless, you know, uh, I'm not, I couldn't tell you the, the uh, makeup of their diet, you know, what percentage of herbs, what percentage of insects is, it's probably opportunistic, you know, whatever they could get. But, you know, if they have access to a, a nice population of uh you know, terrestrial lizards, I'm sure they'll take advantage of that. Okay. And uh, are they primarily, well, I guess like most lizards, they're a diurnal, but are they more uh, crepuscular activity or they're more of a midday activity? No, uh, yeah, more midday, like the desert iguana. That's another one I've worked with. Uh, we used to say when, when it's the hottest and nastiest and nothing else is that, out that's when you'll find the desert iguanas they like the heat they like full sun i i mean i don't know about this nonsense now with 45 days of 115 degrees plus but yeah um and leopard lizards they're i'm sorry they're not out quite in the middle of the day they'll come out about 10 or as soon as it warms up you know they're out there 
unfortunately, in the middle of the road or on a rock, uh, warming up. And, uh, you know, they'll go hunting, and then I, I'm pretty sure they'll take cover, you know, at the worst, the hottest time of day. But the desert yeah. iguanas are out there. Just, I don't know what's up with them. <laughs> they like that heat. Uh, fermenting tough desert plants probably takes a lot of energy. So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. But when I was out in St. George, Utah, I was actually visiting. Okay. Uh, me and a friend of mine were visiting a college friend who lived there at the time. Fantastic. Yeah. Great and, spot. Yeah. He, he's lived there for most of his life. And when we were out there, we found like, you know, saw leopard lizard several different times. And he was kind of mind blown because he was out there this whole time. And we easily doubled the, the amount of leopard lizards he's ever found in his life. Because you're out there at a together, different time. We just put it together. Or? He was uh, looking in the evenings and early mornings oh, right. and not no, no. on the yeah. warm parts of the day. So yeah, fantastic. So yeah, I haven't really worked a lot in that area, but it's it's rich and you know herb fauna as far as far as I know. Was that your experience? Yeah. Or? I definitely I had a lot of lifers on that one half a week trip. So were were the snakes out at the same time? Uh, we only found uh, a couple of uh, Great Basin Rattlers. Oh, okay. Well, you know, that's another one where we're, we're still learning, as you know, about everything. But, uh, you know, the snakes seem to be more crepuscular. You know, they move out, heat up, and then take cover or wait for prey. You know, um, they, they don't move around when it's blistering hot. You know, as you know, it'll be when it's warm and hot, just not intolerable. You know, they'll, they'll move around. The same thing with the late in the day. Now, in the really hot spring and summer nights here in the southwest, you know, they're, they're out hours after sunset, as you probably know. And they're out hunting and moving around. And, you know, as the, the night tends to cool off, they become more inactive. But they, t they seem to, like, take advantage of whatever the, uh, the weather situation is, you know. Yeah. Like, uh... The biggest one we found was maybe like one or two a.m. in the morning. So, oh, really? Yeah. Were so were they just prairies mostly? I mean, uh, Great Basins, or did you run into uh, uh, Diamondbacks or Blacktail, anything like that? We were look. We tried so hard to find Mojaves, but we could only oh, find yeah. uh, Great Basins. Yeah, that was only only found three of them. Uh, one was like early in the. <laughs> it's actually kind of funny story. It's early in the morning, and we were leaving out to go herping for the day sure. and right and just before we hit a dead zone you know no signal zone our friend's mom calls him and says oh hey but there's actually a rattlesnake in the front yard so oh, of course yeah. so we had to book it <laughs> yeah, back. right or or you know under the truck and camp you know that's it's another one is you're you're uh getting in the car to leave and you hear a rattlesnake and they're underneath yeah. it's pretty cool um then, you know uh, I, I mentioned the chiricahua mountains to you earlier i mean your head would explode there, Nate. I mean, twin spotted and, you know, Mojave, Diamondback. Uh, uh, just plus you have, you go what? from Mojave Desert to, uh, you know, uh, Alpine Zone, you know, the top of the Chiricahua's Rustler Park. You're in the, the spruce and, you know, pine, uh, firs. And there's rattlesnakes at all life zones. It's awesome. Is that where the uh, ridge nose rattlers are found as well? Yeah. Well, Grand Canyon. You know, that's a good question. Um, I, you got me there. I'd have to check on that about the ridge nose, but just about you know the Mussaswaga is it, never say it right. Mussaswaga Swaga is also uh, right there in the Chiricahua. This you know this one little pocket, you know, an isolated population in the southwest, just. Uh, uh, south and east of the Chiricahua mountain range. It's kind of a desert wetland oasis situation there. But, you know, the, the biodiversity there in the Chiricahua range in that part of southeast Arizona, southwest New Mexico, it's where the Sierra Madre uh, kind of meets the Rocky Mountain plus the Sonoran Mojave Desert, right? You know, it all mixes up. We have jaguar, coati. Yeah. A, yeah. a lot of these, uh, you know, subtropical birds and uh, herps, and it's, it's, so yeah, it's a, it's an amazing area. Yeah, yeah. 
Did you but, get ridge nose rattlesnake when you were in uh, Utah, Arizona? No, un- no, unfortunately. Like I said, the only ones we ever found were great basins. Yeah, found I've never little I've three never rattlers, found... all great basins. So cool. I've never found well, we kind of, those myself, but we we're kind of lucky on the second one though, and that uh, we had just like spread out on this one spot looking. My friend noticed a fresh shed, and oh, so wow. I just looked underneath a flat rock, and there it was uh, sitting up in there. So when was this now? A few months, a few weeks ago? It was uh, August of 2020. Okay, so it was late summer. So yeah, yeah, it's still a great time, you know, to to be out looking. Um, but uh, what's your uh, what's your most memorable herp sighting out here in the Southwest? Would you say it'd probably be that really large uh, uh, great basin we found at night? So how big was it? I. Uh, I could probably send you a picture later, pictures later, but uh, I'd say probably a solid four foot, maybe more than. That's pretty damn good for a, a Great Basin rattlesnake. You know, they're not normally that big. They're usually about two to three. Well, nowadays, they're usually about two to three feet when you encounter. But uh, yeah, yeah. well, I hope you get to spend more time down here if you, if you uh, need someone to come and carry your uh, snake stick you know give me a call <laughs> any yeah, excuse like to get out yeah yeah cool. uh so uh what we say is the best time of year to go herping in the southwest for the people who are listening uh spring and uh late summer i would say you know if you uh, the best time to kind of best chance to see a good diversity of species the weather um you know the availability of water you have the monsoon and then you're just ending the winter rains vegetation's green a lot of prey species are out in the spring uh in the late summer and fall you know uh reproduction is winding down uh, everybody's getting ready for the uh the winter you know trying to fatten up on prey species a lot of times, you know, we'll have, uh, excuse me, altitudinal uh, migration, you know, especially here in Tucson, the, the tiger rattlesnakes uh, will come down and unfortunately the golf courses have trashed a lot of these areas, but they're still in the golf courses because the water attracts a lot of K-rats. Yeah. Other, yes. but then, you know, they'll move, they'll move up, you know, in the, uh, uh, I think the yeah the summer months you know I guess it's a little cooler moving up in the summer and uh, but you know a lot of times their <clears throat> the population becomes isolated due to roads and all this uh, uh, habitat destruction I I really don't know the status there's a a, a couple of people down here who are of course herp experts one of the tiger rattlesnakes guy well rattlesnake guru down here is matt good he's a professor at the uh, university of arizona here but he'd, he'd be an interesting one to get hold matt of good. matt yeah, good I'm writing G- one down, so. uh, yeah g-o-d-e <clears throat> okay got it yeah we'll look that up right now but uh yeah tiger rattlers that's another uh bucket list species for me right oh, there yeah yeah, well, he he's a guy I could literally, I mean, they let him, they used to let him just use a golf cart, drive around all night on the course. You know, I went out with him a few times and you got the whole place to little bobcats with their kittens. And uh, the tigers were, were still out there in the early spring and he'll drive right up to it. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say a golf course with all that artificial artificially uh, concentrated water sounds like a herb magnet. Yeah. So. Yeah, actually uh, reminds me of a, an experience. I was at a, a small Air, Air Force Air Station near Gila Bend, uh, population three. You know, I'm not quite that low, but not a lot of people. And uh, being with the DOD, I was screwing around with some night vision goggles one night. And, of course... <laughs> Of course, the military government job. 
Oh yeah, one of the perks, and uh, you know, uh, being the the uh, military, all these little bases usually have a golf course, you know. <laughs> so I went out to this little golf course, you know, and put on the uh, night vision. I was astounded, you know. It was like right where the desert meets the the green grass on the golf course. I don't know the exact distance, but I swear it was almost like people placed them there. Every like 10 yards, there was a rattlesnake coiled facing the golf course, like waiting for the fast food to be delivered, you know, and I, I'm sure, you know, the herps, right? You go, you'd go running in there too, nice green uh, grass and water, and whatever. And uh, these rattlesnakes were just like, like they were placed out there. Uh, it was like every 10 yards and I, I couldn't believe, you know, in the night vision, I could see them, but screwing around even with a flashlight, you know, they weren't so obvious. But that was kind of interesting. <laughs> yes. So have you done any uh, herping outside of the Southwest? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I probably like you, you know, I'm a, I'm a nature nerd, and my vacations are also out, you know, chasing critters and birding or herping or whatever. And uh, so I've I've – been lucky. Uh, I, I was uh, in, uh, boy, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was Peru. And uh, we had just walked around this dirt road one morning, and uh, right across the dirt road was this uh, 10 foot, minimum 10 foot long uh, red tail rock python. And it had just eaten. And, uh, you know, I mean, you just walk right up to it. It's like a little speed bump to step over. <laughs> you know, just not concerned at all with us. And just one of the other. Yeah. Python, a rock. Yeah. Rock python. Rock boa, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you looked that one up. I, I didn't realize it got so big. But it was <laughs> a beautiful snake. And uh, so I, I've been in Australia. You want to talk about a where herpers want to go and die that that's one of the places uh really amazing um and uh, uh papua new guinea I, I i i didn't you know boy that place is just so thick you know vegetation wise and uh tropical it, it i was i saw a lot of birds of paradise and other wonderful things but also that's a uh one of the green tree boas is there tree pythons you know it's beautiful yeah yeah um, i have a I have a green tree python right down there so oh really okay beautiful snake and you know in australasia right you would probably know this better than me but um don't they have like a 140 species of snake or something like that and like 100 are venomous yeah you know some, wow. some ridiculously high proportion yeah 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 but uh, that that place, you'd be in heaven. You know, not just the snakes, but you know, the herps and amphibians. And well, of course, they're herps. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Hawaii. I was, I was fortunate enough to be born and raised there. But all the herps there, except the uh, sea turtles, you know, the marine. And and there's a, yeah. a sea snake that occasionally washes up on shore. You know, everything's introduced. So bring your field guide to the herps of Southeast Asia, you know, or, or Colombia or whatever. I mean, you know, Jackson's chameleons, uh, uh, Seychelles, uh, Seychelles Agecko, Agecko, yeah. right, you know, the whole story. So that, that's interesting. Um, but, yeah, yeah I, I, I try. I've been, uh, I've been lucky enough to visit some really nice places, and I'm always – looking for herps and birds and mammals. So those were some of my more memorable experiences. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is your most uh, memorable uh, herping find? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I did find a... Uh, Boy, I'd have to send you a photo. Uh, I found this really interesting turtle on Okinawa in a bamboo forest. It was an endemic, and it had jagged edges to the shell all the way around. And uh, yeah. 
the people I was with didn't even know what it was, but that was just really exciting, you know, for me. Uh, it was it wasn't an unknown species, but apparently rare enough that everybody, all the Japanese biologists, got really excited. I'll have to look that one up. But um, one time, I, a friend of mine was visiting from Hawaii, and we were out herping and birding out in the Goldwater Range in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, looking around all morning, you know, and didn't really uh, have a lot of luck with herps. Got back into the pickup truck, and we're, we're you know, writing in our field notes, eating Twinkies, whatever, you know. And, and all of a sudden, this huge rattle goes off. I mean, it was the loudest rattlesnake I'd ever heard. And it was a huge, minimum of five feet, Mojave rattlesnake. And uh, it was already under the truck, apparently, when we, we came back and got in. But um, sitting in the truck and bouncing around, didn't, he wasn't happy about that. And he let us know it. But uh, we took some pictures, that sort of thing. So that was, and the Gila monsters. I get Gila monsters. I love Gila monsters. They're just cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I, is there any is there any piece of uh, kit or gear that you would recommend uh, people all people should carry with them when they go herping? Definitely your your phone or a camera. Uh, you know, and again, a, a location is really important. Even if you don't have a GPS, you know, you know, you, you could say east of St. George, you know, something like that, because data is very important. And uh, all you got to do is is see it record it and uh, report it and it goes a long way towards conservation so maybe some you know uh latex glo- uh, not latex what do they call it? the gloves uh like silicone is know, that uh, it? i yeah i can't remember just latex gloves are fine just that um maybe a herp stick you know snake stick or or tongs yeah. uh um uh um, binoculars are good too because you know some species you don't want to disturb them or get in the face of a big Mojave rattlesnake or something, but you can really pick up detail even five feet away with a good pair of binoculars. Um, yeah, and uh, and and uh, something to record your field notes, either a little, you know, record it on your phone or a notebook. And uh, yeah, in terms of kit, yeah, that those are the basics. Okay. Uh, I remember you mentioned you did some work with uh, sea turtles over in the Pacific. Uh, you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, wonderful animals. Uh, when I was growing up in Hawaii, I did a lot of, you know, uh, free di- skin diving, you know, without a tank, snorkeling, spearfishing, all that. And you rarely saw a sea turtle. You know, they had just been pretty much wiped out around the main islands and, or just learn to stay away, you know, to survive. And since the yeah. hunting ban went into effect and people got educated, they are now hauling out on several main islands, uh, laying eggs. You got uh, hawksbill, green sea turtles. I believe uh, Olive Ridley, I could be wrong. I never encountered those personally. But, uh, you know, they'll haul out now. You could be on your towel 10 feet away, you know, with a, with a basking sea turtle right next to you. And you'll see them uh, yeah. a lot of times at, at different tides eating the seaweed. You know, we call it limu and uh, swimming. Now you can see them regularly, even, even snorkeling. But uh, we, we would tag them. Uh, you know, since then, I'm sure they did a lot of satellite telemetry. The uh, movement of sea turtles, as you know, is is astounding. You know, they cross the oceans and uh, really circumnavigate the globe. A lot of them like the leatherback. But uh, it, it's yeah. it's a beautiful, beautiful animal. One one animal that really fascinates me are sea snakes. You know, especially the uh, pelagic open ocean, oceanic ones that just drift with the the currents. And, you know, we don't know a lot about them. Yeah. 
Well, I do live in uh, Earth's most uh, remote habitat. I'm sorry? Well, they do live in uh, Earth's most remote habitat, so it's probably uh, pretty hard to find them. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, in Hawaii, I, I don't, I've never known anybody to find one alive swimming around. I found them. It's the yellow-bellied sea snake, beautiful blue and yellow and black. Um, they'll wash up after storms on the beach. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in the, in the south – West Pacific, you know, like the Solomon Islands and uh, getting out that way, Palau, Micronesia, you know, you've got them. They'll come ashore. You know, you run into them in the in the mangroves or rocks on the beaches and whatever. And then they'll, you know, return to the ocean and hunt and breed and whatever. But, I mean, the uh, deep sea sea snakes like the yellow belly, they just they're just out there you know, floating around and, you know, 10,000 feet of water, you know, I'd be worried, <laughs> you know, with all the tiger sharks and everything out, but they seem to be doing very well. Yeah. Well, I can't think of any uh, questions off the top of my head. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, well, I've been doing most of the talking, <laughs> but I, I, I appreciate your, uh, giving me the forum to to talk about uh, conservation and some of the concerns. And also it's fun to just talk herbs with someone, you know, a colleague. So I really appreciate yeah. the opportunity, Nate. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, uh, are you, do, do you, uh, do, do you post weekly or every daily or what, what on your uh, I, blog? Uh, I pretty much, upload as soon as I can get done with all the editing and stuff like that. But it's not, I don't do it as regularly as I want to, but oh, I, was I just basically curious. do it as soon as I can get guests on. But Cool. Well, you know, it goes a long way. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest, one of the best things anyone can do nowadays is spread the word, environmental education, conservation, you know, getting the kids interested. You know what's out there everything you know they're playing with phones and computers now but getting one of them out to handle a, a little snake or turtle you know goes a long way and your blog reaches lots of people i'm sure so i just want to express appreciation for what you're doing oh, thank you uh so if people want to get in contact with you uh what would be a preferred way to do that uh email uh i'm on facebook but if you want to just Contact me directly. Um, I'm open to that. I'm always up for anything to do with wildlife and people's interests, helping them learn or even, you know, uh, see things, you know, find them. And, but my email is is Bruce, B-R-U-C dot Eilerts, my last name, E-I-L-E-R-T-S at gmail.com. All right. So, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you. Looking forward to seeing your your uh, future features as well. And thank you again. That's been my pleasure. Take care.